Our last session uh, for this conference is all about the question, what's next? <laughs> the pilots are no longer pilots. This is already a huge success, I think, for the Milo project. What can we do to scale up the, the projects or the pilots? And what can we do to bring urban logistics to the next stage when Lamilo doesn't exist any longer? We also involve a EU representative in discussion now to talk about uh, the future uh, funding possibilities. So I would like to uh, invite to the floor into the stage uh, Kevin Churchill from uh, the London Borough of Camden, Birgit Hendricks, Ikuto City and Christoph Vogel um, from Brussel Mobilité, the pilots that we know, and uh, Ruud Lauers, of course, uh, program director for the Interact uh, programs. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, Michael is not here. Uh, Michael Deschambeau had to leave, unfortunately, but we are glad that three of the pilots are uh, still here. Uh, Mr. Lauers, welcome. Um, let me first ask what are the next steps in your pilot? Can it be scaled up? Kevin. Uh, yes, it certainly can. Um, the next step for, for our work is to uh, really sort of bed it in as business as usual within the council. Uh, so, like you said in your introduction, Vin, to move from um, a, a, a pilot project um, into sort of mainstream activity that the council now does, um, and make sure that the the way of working with the consolidation centre is um, widely communicated and widely adopted uh, by by all staff across uh, the council, uh, Camden, um, and we hope that's the, the the case also with the uh, our partner councils, um, Enfield, Islington, and, and Waltham Forest. So the steps to take are mainly about communication? Um, I think there, there are two things really, uh, well perhaps three things. Um, so we're, we're undertaking a procurement exercise at the moment to um, appoint a long-term uh, logistics provider uh, for consolidation centre services. Uh, so that, that procurement exercise will conclude in the late summer um, mm -hmm. and we'll award a contract um, to the successful tenderer for, for, for the long-term service. Uh, the new contract, um, if we manage to stick to the timescale, we'll, we'll, which we hope we will, will go live in October uh, 2015 for a period of four years. Uh, so that's the first thing to do. Um, the, the, the second thing to do is then to communicate the, the, that, that contract um, is now in place uh, to, to the wider colleagues across the council, and, and make sure all of the um, make sure the, the awareness. Um, is, uh, is, is spread, is spread. Mm -hmm. that's right and then we've got a um, piece of work to do with um, uh, the council's supply chain um, firstly migrating the, uh, the the supply chain that's in the existing uh, service uh, into the new service um, whoever the, the successful tenderer um, will be uh, and then we've got um, a piece of work to do that, that um, increases the number of suppliers and supply chains that we've got um, in, the, in the council at the moment um, going through the, the, the new consolidation centre. So okay. quite a lot of work to do, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but heading in, heading in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Christophe, what's the next step um, for Brussels Mobilité? For Brussels Mobilité, uh, the thing is that we, we know uh, that City Depot and others, they need volumes to be profitable. So we want to assure them some volumes. And, and uh, how do you do that? Yeah, we have three quite of solutions. We are thinking about a label for uh, every operator using what we can call green logistics or making its job in a sustainable way. So we try to, to find a good way to, to labelize it. Maybe not by creating a label, but maybe finding another label already existing or com combining some of, mm -hmm. some of them. Uh, a label was suggested here yeah. earlier, is that, but it's not a label on the box, but a label for a kind of yeah. quality green quality logistics things. label for and, the and suppliers. And then you, you can have maybe some um, advantages when, you're, when you have this label. You can go in the city center after the, the normal hours, or you can go uh, for a public procurement, we, we want to, to put the label in the, the procurement saying that we need someone who's doing the right, the right mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, so the second solution is also to, uh, to be a, a client of this kind of uh, business ourselves, like Camden did. Why not Brussels Mobility? Why not the, the municipality of Brussels? Every, I think every uh, public authority must 
do this, this job by himself, just saying, how are we delivered now, and how can it be uh, better, and how can we use this kind of, s okay. of services. And the third way is, I would say, the, the normal way for uh, public administration is putting measures like access restrictions and uh, time windows and so on to, to give disadvantage to, the, to these operators. But I, I will also say what is next for, for City Depot, because as I said, they are continuing, but they are also growing. They just moved from uh, the, the first uh, warehouse to a bigger one. That's a good sign. La last, uh, last week. And um, they opened up their, um, their um, how do you say that? Uh, well, they, they are now uh, working together with the Belgian Post. Belgian Post was a former competitor. They had their own project in Antwerp. And so they are now working together. They, they sort of merge, if you want. And so it's very good because instead of cutting the flows between two operators, they are uh, putting their efforts together just to, to, to create something better. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, they are also already uh, thinking about a second hub because one is not enough for Brussels, so they are looking for a second location. Okay, so it's growing. It's, it's growing. growing. Yes. Very good. Birgit, what are your plans with uh, Ecoto City? Um, of course, in this project we demonstrated the freight circle, so the two consumer solution, uh, but we demonstrated only in one neighborhood in the city. So, of course, we can scale up to other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But um, um, if we really, uh, all, everybody, all the demonstration partners, everybody's talking about volume. And if we really want to have enough volume to really have an impact on the neighborhoods and the cities, we need these bottom-up approaches like we do in the Netherlands, like the City Depot and Brussels is doing in, in, in Belgium, unlike uh, the guys in UK are doing. So we need these bottom-up approaches, but we need to cooperate on a European level in order to talk to uh, guys like Lee Vindicator from Procter & Gamble. So we need both mm -hmm. this, this bottom-up and scale up in, the own, in your own city, as we do in our cities. But we need to create this network and work together and have contracts with European players. Because I know only from our day-to-day -to -day experience today, I think 60 to 70% of the shippers taking their goods to our hub, bringing it to their end customer in, in our city, they come from all over Europe. I cannot contract them on a national level. Mm -hmm. So we need to scale up everywhere. So we have lots of work to be done, Kevin, yes. Yeah. <laughs> are the three of you, are, are all three of you convinced that, that your model is transferable? Can any city of any size implement these models? Kevin? Yes, I, I, I think they can. Um, I, I think rather than perhaps cities implementing models, um, I think it's organisations within cities that, that, that can impl implement these models. And I think there, there are numerous um, public and private sector organisations um, within cities. I'm obviously from a, a you know one private sector, a public sector rather, uh, organisation with, with, within London. Um, there are 33 um, you know, uh, London boroughs, if you like. With it within London, um, so that's uh, 30, 33. But um, what you. what about outside of London in smaller cities? Um. Um, uh, absolutely, um, I, I think I think you know there's no reason why um, it's it's not transferable to, to smaller cities too. Um, I think there has to be a problem there that needs to be solved. Um, uh, you know, a problem of perhaps urban congestion, um, you know, air pollution, and, uh, and so on. There has to be a driver. There has to be a reason to do it. Um, but but there are more reasons to do it really than there, than there are barriers. Um, you know, the barriers can be worked through and sort of one by one overcome. Um, but, but there's no reason why it isn't, isn't transferable to, to other organizations and by definition other cities, big or small. Okay. How important was European funding within the Limila project for you in order to really get started or to give a boost to your project? Crystal? Um, actually, funding is, is a very good thing. It, uh, it was used in Brussels just to, to get the depot start with the activities and get an incentive. But it's not all about funding. 
it's the pr European project is it's about motivation. It's about having a time frame that must be uh, encountered, uh, giving you objectives. You you need results. And uh, for us, it was really a booster on, on that way. Mm -hmm. And also that once you come to, to every stakeholder saying that we are in a European project, we have support from the European Commission, we are working with uh, people from other countries, it creates a, a dynamic. And, and we were very much surfing on that. As I said, we had the, the city of Brussels very much in, engaged in the project and also the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and everyone was just going with us. So funding is important, but it's not all about funding. It's not all about funding, but it was important to get started. Ruth Lauritsen must be pleased to hear that. Well, I don't think I have to say anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I can go back. <laughs> no, but uh, it seems that it, it is very important to have this kind of European funding in order to create an initiative and then get started. Definitely. I think this is just not just for Lemido, but for all the uh, 114 projects that we have funded, I think, in the, in the past period, uh, period. This is indeed uh, one of the most important elements. It's a start. It's a boost. It's basically some sort of, uh, let's say, kickoff funding. Uh, I think that's the basic idea of this interreg. Uh, little pot of money for this huge area, because if you, if you divide it by the number of inhabitants we have to serve, it's only one or two euros per head. Mm -hmm. But, you know, doing some of the these kind of uh, uh, elementary things that are very important for citizens this case, this, in this case in, in, in cities is really making a difference and I think it's, let's say, the, uh, yeah, sometimes Europe is criticized for all the rules and regulations it, it devised, but I think it also has a very positive boost in these kind of, uh, of, of ventures. It's, it's, it's a little bit of an, an, an unofficial way of trying to do something, you know, it's not like getting a, Government, governments on board. It's like trying to something, to create something which is developed bottom up. So the the motivation is there, uh, the local motivation is there, and of course our challenge is to get this transnational element in in that kind of project. Yes, and the Lamilo project is trying to close now. It's going to end. Which which funding will be available for? other projects, other pilots in the future? What kind of projects are you looking for? Well, first of all, there are many things that will continue. First of all, uh, we are not a, a transport program. So we are not supporting transport projects per se. We are pr uh, supporting projects that contribute to the co cohesion of Europe. Mm -hmm. It's under the cohesion uh, p policy. So I think that's something which is important, not just for the the, 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 you know, for the matter of speech, but also it has very practical implications. For instance, very simple things, or simple things, some, sometimes very complicated things, like uh, intellectual property rights, are definitely dealt differently, for instance, in the Horizon 2020 program, compared to Interreg programs and other cohesion funds programs. The idea is that in cohesion you do something which has to do with solidarity, with reducing disparities amongst regions, these kind of things. Basically, if you want to use very big words, creating Europe. Um, and you cannot do that if you are starting to protect your knowledge. And I think therefore we have uh, uh, promoted many, many open innovation projects, uh, doing things together and sharing the knowledge, certainly within a project and preferably also with the whole of Europe, the European uh, uh, markets and sectors, and I think projects like like La Milo really clo yeah, show that results are feasible. And I think this is definitely the step that is going to be made. It's all over Europe. Every the, the, the buzzword, the keyword is is results. If you look at the new program document, which which has, uh, I'm happy to say, approved been approved by the Commission last uh, week. Um, if you just do a word count on how many times you find the word implementation. It's 99 times. It's about implementation. It's not anymore about creating new strategies, toolboxes. Uh, you know, all these things can still be done and are still important if they lead to something that is going to be implemented. Yes, so but when it comes to implementation, this project was a success because you have four pilots going on. Yeah, and I think that is ba that's basically what we're looking for. And that's also what we are asking for in the new applications, much more, more, more focused, is what will happen with, your, uh, with what you have done mm -hmm. in the project after five and 10 years? What will be still, still be there? You know, you, of course you cannot predict the future t 10 years ago, but you can, on the point you are now, you, I think there is clear demonstration of what's going to happen in the, in the near future. And what we ask is to have also this perspective, even at the start of your project, 
to, to, to put yourself at the end of the project and look up if we have reached these results that we have now described. And we are, we are asking much more for quantified results, you know, with baselines, with analyzing the trends which are already there. Uh, and for instance, for a project like La Milo, it would, it would, in my view, say you really have to find a new niche because if I listen to all of you, this is really picked up. There is a trend of picking up this kind of things. And if you it's simply reading, reading newspapers in Brussels, there's all kind of, of news around this, this uh, city mobility and, and certainly freight. Uh, and not just from La Milo, of course, but all of this. So there's a lot, yep. loads of things happening, a lot of trends. So basically, the trend is positive. There's a, there's a development. People see the need to do something. In my case, that, in my view, that would mean pretty much for us that this specifically uh, would not be something for the new program. Anyway, the program is also more focused, and there is only three, uh, three priorities, and one of them has to do with transport, but then particularly on greenhouse gas re uh, emission reductions. Okay. So we will definitely. So it's more limited. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's also something. You know, if you look at the at the at the application, original application, I went back a bit in time at the original application of La Milo, and it says it had three aims. I think we would now basically advise a project with three aims to split up in three projects. Okay. With concrete aims, concrete results, concrete baselines, concrete targets. So you can really say, okay, this is what we wanted to achieve for that and that reason, and this is what we have done. And of course, it doesn't have to match 100%, but you can always explain why you didn't completely match or why you over, over uh, should. And I think uh, that's definitely the case for Limino. I think there's definitely more yeah. achieved than was, uh, was, uh, was aimed at. at the OK. Start. Questions? No questions. Oh, that's very clear. No <laughs> questions? <laughs> Everything was clear? Or no people interested in? Uh, Funding of <laughs> one question over there. Can I have a rent condition? Perhaps I have one question for Christoph. Um, if you speak about uh, privileges uh, for companies who consolidate their goods and deliver, uh, in the first deck that we saw in the presentation, you see that there is um, a current process that's already working, and that um, the consolidation of goods is an add-on of um, something that yeah, can, can be improved. Uh, in that matter, I think a lot of companies already fit in the, um, the profile that they consolidate their own goods and they deliver in a, in a small area with dense uh, customers. Um, they are long in a city, for, for instance. So don't you think that there is a risk that, um, that, uh, that uh, only players um, with consolidated goods, that more proof, um, privileges than yeah, existing companies. I mean, <laughs> it could be that somebody is already fitting into the profile that that we create uh, with consi um, consolidating goods, and they will not uh, have the same privileges. Yeah, but uh, it's about uh, evidences. If they can show us that they are consolidating goods and they are efficient, I think they deserve to, to have the same uh, advantages as the others. But what we want to track in, in Brussels is the ineffective part of, of logistics, which is huge in cities. We know we, we have, be, uh, have been uh, studying that for our strategic plan, that 45% of, of the goods are causing 80% of the movements in, in the cities because they are not efficient. It's about one pallet of one parcel coming with one truck into Brussels, just delivered at, at the address and leaving the town. Why is this just one parcel coming with one truck? Should be consolidated. So I have no problem with an actor saying that I'm con consolidating, I have this kind of, uh, of uh, fill rate, and I'm using this kind of vehicles. I want to have the same advantage as City Depot. For me, it's OK. But we have to, to think about what we really want and what we should put in that label. And this study will just start in September. So I don't have the answer now. But for, mo for the moment, we are not opposite to anything. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that, Vivian? Um, from my point of view, which is, of course, the commercial side, the business side, 
I think every local government should be very outspoken about what they want when it comes to freight traffic in the city and what they not want. So build the right regulation. But I know, and that's what Philip told in the, in the previous session, companies always are very eager on stressing that it should be a level playing field. So if you, like, like Christophe says, if you give some extra permission to some companies, it should be on an open and transparent mm -hmm. basis. And it should be open for everybody who is able to reach those, those numbers. Criteria. And, mm -hmm. and, and then I think we have won a lot if we are going to work like this. But it needs a local government who is very outspoken okay. and not only in a sump but in a, in a sustainable urban logistics plan, not only mobility because in mobility plans there's usually not much about freight. So it should be very specific about logistics, like Brussels did, or Brussels region, I don't know, somebody, right. somebody. <laughs> um, Brussels region. Yeah, yes, um, so that, that's, that's a great start. Have, have a, a good vision and have a goal on what you want in your city. And then the market can start to act on it. Yeah. OK, you agree. I do. I mean, on, on, on that point, really, I think it's a classic sort of supply and demand type problem. Um, so certainly, you know, there's lots of benefit and lots of merit in um, transport strategy colleagues and urban planning colleagues designing the right sort of um, strategies around when certain, uh, you know, restriction of hours and deliveries and so on can, can take place. But I think there's things that procurers and buyers like myself uh, can, can be doing, you know, alongside that and possibly even before that, because we can move, we can move perhaps a little bit more quickly than some of the, the policy development work and that's um, you know we, we can start um, sort of demanding if you like and asking for um, similar things that have been spoken about today you know various delivery options and we can lead the way through our sort of procurement exercises by um, asking for deliveries to consolidation centers and, and so on um, that's on the on, on the buy side I think the flip side to that on the supply side is that um, you know, co companies out there, suppliers of goods and services, logistics companies, um, courier companies can, can offer, um, you know, to meet the demand, they, they can offer the, the, the supply of um, delivery options, of consolidated deliveries to consolidation centres, create those consolidation centres perhaps, and, you know, offer public sector buyers, um, some of us are pre prepared to buy those sorts of services, you know, off, offer, offer in those sorts of services, so, so local com uh, local um, authorities, other public and private sector organisations yeah. combine them. So I think it's a classic supply and demand, and I think probably in reality, um, it, 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 what we'll do is slowly move together, move forward together with, with, with the supply and with the demand, sort of you know, gradually, organically meeting each other. Howard. Uh, Sorry, uh, just for, for Ruth, uh, one, one comment and one question. Uh, I think, uh, you, you, as I understand, you're basically saying, looking forward, that the urban uh, delivery sector is, let's say, done at this stage. Uh, uh, it's well underway. Uh, but of course, don't forget that there's a whole area of rural, rural deliveries which are probably far more difficult um, and who will have a certain amount to pick up from what's been discussed over the Lamilo project, but will be, as I say, rather different and rather different approaches will have to be d dealt with. Simply, you can't use a bike uh, for 50 kilometers uh, every day. But that's... But zero em emission vans oh, are... Oh, very feasible. good. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, that, that, that's one thing. The other is, we're looking forward to the new program. Uh, one of the major difficulties that t has bedeviled the current program, but I suspect it's going to be a lot worse for the new program, is this question of matching funding. Um, will, uh, in your opinion, organizations, private in particular, and public organizations as well, be able to afford to participate in any of these new programs? Mm -hmm. First to your first uh, remark, I, I, I agree with you. There, I'm not saying there's nothing to be done on, on transport, logistics, or whatever you, uh, you're talking about. I think there's, the only thing is it has to be uh, aligned with the uh, needs for the program. The program uh, committee has said we have three priorities, and one of them is greenhouse gas emissions. And under that umbrella, you can do stuff for, in transport. 
So, you know, but then it has to, you know, it has to be accountable on greenhouse gas emissions. And that's different compared to the current program, clearly. Yeah. Um, the other part, is it going to be, um, uh, yeah, more, I'm, more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> more difficult to find your match funding. I, I think I would like, I, personally, I think you should turn that question around. I think you, you should look at, at programs like ours, not only ours, but all uh, uh, cohesion uh, funding uh, uh, programs, as an opportunity to enhance, to improve, to speed up something you were planning already. If an organization is going to do something in a, pro pro in a program or project that they never intended to do, I think it will never become a success. So it has to, has to absolutely be in line with the core business of, of the company or the uh, institution or the whatever, of each partner. You know, if a partner doesn't, is not ha having the idea, then why would you start on something? So I, I wouldn't see it as, as, match fun ma as, as the problem of match funding. I think we are match funding for you. I think we provide, and we provide 10% more than, than in, the, in, the, in the current program, so we, we now have a 60% ground rate maximum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, <laughs> we, we provide for you, and I think it's, it's I would, if you, and I think, it, I know it's difficult for, for policy, polit political people to see it that, that way, because they, they, you know, someone comes with a bright idea and says, I want to do this in a, in a European pro pro program, but I need, uh, now in this case, 40%. And then the political person will start sighing and say, okay, my budget is already da 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 But then I think you should sell it the other way around. You were intending to do this and that and that. I found partners in all over Europe, and it also happens that I get 60% of what you otherwise would have to fund 100%. I, get, I, I give you 60. I think it's just a, a, a matter of uh, presenting. I know that small small businesses, uh, definitely small business, but also small NGOs have struggled, and basically and most importantly with cash with cash flows. Yes, uh, have. we have made many proposals. We have had fierce discussions within the uh, with member states, but there are some. Well, th there's still a, a proposal pending. Next uh, 9th uh, July, there will be a decision on this to to pr to to propose something like a, a, an advance payment for small. Uh, NGOs and SMEs, a small amount which basically could help them, you know, start start uh, participating in the project. We know that this is one of the key key issues. Of course, paying afterwards is is for small small businesses and NGOs very difficult to to pre fund. I, we are rare, but there's also let, let's say the political need that uh, you know our member states take this in my view very tiny risk that one of those uh, might trip over and might not make it to the end of the project and might, we might lose this advance. But in my view, we talk about a small amount, small, com small organization, so I, I would say the risk is pretty limited and, pr and personally I'm very much in favor of installing mm. a, a, a rule like that. So we are still you know, trying to improve things. We are aware of, of the main challenges. Uh, at least we think we have had me me very much feedback on, on all kinds of things that we, we think we need to improve. Yeah, and we're, and we're trying to get there. That's <laughs> yes, in the back, another question there. Uh, what I am missing a little bit in the debate is uh, the aspect of uh, multimodality in the city distribution. Here in Brussels, we have the channel, we have the river teams in London. What about deliveries of goods uh, to waterways, perhaps railway stations, and also towards specific flows in city distribution? For instance, uh, flows towards uh, construction sites and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that something you want to stimulate from a European perspective? I I think, I think, first of all, there has to be a bottom-up uh, idea. Uh, I, I personally know of uh, the this famous beer boat in, in Utrecht, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, speaking about flows. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, I think I that... I like one. <laughs> <That's it? laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Go on. No, but I, I, I think that would be uh, an issue. If you can prove that this, re this it reduces, and I think the mod uh, mod modal shift definitely, uh, you know, in, as an idea, has a, has a, will contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gases. 
However, you have to, in, in the new program, uh, more, we won't take you for your word, you know. We would like to see that you prove to us that this really is going, the actions that you're going to take in this modal shift will really lead to the modal shift and that this modal shift will really lead to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's basically what we are going to be much more stringent on than we were before. Mm -hmm. Did any of the pilots ever think about using waterways for city transport, Christophe? Yeah, uh, but Carl knows about it because uh, we are working together with the Port of Brussels. Port of Brussels was a sub-partner in, in Lamido because they provided the, the warehouse. So we are quite close and we are working together. Uh, and actually, um, the Port of Brussels had another interreg program called uh, Connecting Cities and Port 21. Mm -hmm. And uh, on which they, they build this infrastructure to, to load pallets from uh, a boat to, uh, to the ground and can be delivered in, in the city uh, afterwards. And uh, actually, we spoke about that with City Depot. And at the time, they were saying that, yeah, in a, in a three months' time, we can start working with that. And after that, we showed it was maybe a bit diffi more difficult than we, we thought. So mm -hmm. it's on its way, and we, we still believe that can be a solution, but uh, not today and not with City Depot, but uh, still uh, we're working on it. Uh, okay, every day. it's a possibility to think of uh, in the future. Any other question? Yes. Well, I have to uh, correct uh, Christophe. Uh, on uh -huh. um, maybe not in Brussels, but in Hasselt, we are starting a project with uh, Puckle Pop. Maybe everybody knows this. A uh, big festival, festival, pop festival, yes. And we are delivering the total Without backstage by water. So uh -huh. uh, the total backstage is put on a boat uh, on the channel, uh, Antwerp, Brussels. It's going through the harbor of uh, Antwerp. Uh, through the Albert Canal, and then uh, it's uh, put on the wall. Wall? Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but it's uh, put on land uh, at, uh, in Hasselt at our facility, and from there on, we are delivering uh, the pallets uh, at the festival site. So actually, we are starting what we have promised we would do. <laughs> okay, that's good news. <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank uh, again uh, Kevin Churchill, Ruth Lauers, Christophe de Vogel, and Birgit Hendricks for participating in this panel. Thank you very much. I'm going to let Ruth return to his seat because I still need the other three of you, uh, especially Birgit actually, Birgit. because you're I going can. to introduce yeah. some news for us. So please take the floor and, oh, and go ahead, Birgit. Yes. Well, um, uh, as Ruth mentioned, um, Interreg uh, really wants us to work transnational and to disseminate what we did in our project to other countries and to other cities, other regions and so on. And of course we want, and in fact today is a little bit of a sad day because it's the last day of our now, not, we have to do a lot of work and we have some time to end up all the, the reports, but um, we're meeting here for the last time in this, in this project. So it's really a sad occasion, in fact. But there is life after La Milo, of course. Um, so um, we came up with the idea of creating a sort of city logistics network of real operational like you want, you want implementations and we did and I think in this project we can be very proud of what we achieved in the operational projects because I've seen a lot of European projects whether it's Horizon 2020 or FP7 or whatever I don't know or EEE or whatever um, and lots of projects fail or die after the subsidy phase. And I think what we accomplished here in this project is at least up till now, and you've seen and heard us very much, we really want to continue all this after the project. And I think that's great job done. But there is a lot of work to be done after this. And we need far more bottom-up approaches to really grow over Europe. So that's why we made a very simple website. Can, can we see the website, Tara? Or, or the, at least the map with, with some. And we have, we have pointed some flags 
only a few, as you can see in the Netherlands and in, in the UK and in Belgium and in, in France, from the companies, the, the operational projects in what we have today in this project. But we have Norway in the room. Norway, I, Norway, are you there? Yes, yes, you're there. I know you're there. So we have Norway in the room. We have Luxembourg in the room. We have all kinds of countries and cities in the room. And something is happening there. And I think what I mentioned earlier, we should really exchange what we have learned in this project and in other projects. So um, I invite you all to look in your own country, in your own city, in your own region, uh, to plant your flag. And especially, Michael, could you, could you step to the stage, please? Do we have a mic? A microphone somewhere? <laughs> Tara, come up. Because I realize, I think this is the third time I'm, I'm on stage. And it's too much honor for me. And I want to honor Michael, because Michael's from Scotland. And he wanted a demonstration project as well. But I think you're going to plant your flag next Friday. Tell me, what happened in Scotland? Uh, Just yes. to give Mike very Kearns, small... Mike from Takchan, who's the, the quiet partner in Mamelo. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I represent, uh, come from a region on the east, eastern side of Scotland. If you can see from the back, we're just about there. Uh, so pretty much on the fringe of Europe. But we entered a project uh, on the basis of trying to introduce a consolidation centre in a small city, a city of 50,000 population. And where we were coming from was air quality. A city like many other small, medium-sized cities right across Europe actually has air quality issues. And the air quality issues are caused by predominantly in Perth commercial vehicles. So we joined the project in the hope of proving what was feasible for a small city in Lamelo, We actually went through a lengthy process of public sector procurement. Uh, we started off putting together uh, a brief, uh, put it out to standard logistics companies via uh, an open tender. Uh, and we gave them some deadlines to reach. We said it'd be 18 months funding. After that, we'd expect the project to, to sink or swim financially. Uh, but it was very much up to what we hoped would be the successful tenderer to develop the business, do all the marketing, get the uh, retailers and office and users and so on on board. Uh, we went through the procurement process, cutting a long story short. We didn't succeed in appointing a contractor. Having gone over that hurdle, we directly approached uh, some of the larger logis logistics companies that have provided consolidation elsewhere in the UK. Again, cutting a long story short, we, we came to a dead end. Uh, so what we did, largely through Lamelo, entirely through Lamelo in fact, uh, was looking at the experience from Birgit and Max from EcoCity and their experiences with Ben and Stad service. We had a couple of entrepreneur opportunity events in Perth last autumn. We worked with our local authority colleagues uh, in the economic development sections for them to contact anybody they thought who might be interested in developing a business from scratch. Uh, we widely advertised it via the local press, via contacts that we knew through the trade associations and so on. And to be honest, I was very pleasantly surprised at the first meeting we actually got six firms turned off. I'd been a little bit sceptical and thought, well, there'll be Birgit, Max, me, and one or two others speaking to nobody. <laughs> Just so this is a city of 50,000 population uh, with air quality issues. No real transport issues for the freight sector. There is congestion, but very much in the peak periods. If you're delivering to a city centre shop, so as long as you avoid the peak periods, you'll get in fairly easily. But it's still giving rise to air quality issues. Uh, and certainly of the six businesses that turned up, they were, were all local businesses. Um, there was one that we had some inkling, had a little bit of a notion what consolidation was. Uh, but the response was very positive. Uh, we felt sufficiently enthused to hold a second meeting a couple of months later. And as a result, as a result of that, we were currently working with 
a local business, actually in Dundee, which is about 30 kilometres away. Uh, they are a social enterprise, so we're looking at the same sort of basis that Birgit and Max started with, very small, locally based business, with perhaps more modest, more modest uh, profit aims because of a social enterprise, but nevertheless has to be financially sustainable. Uh, we've been working with them for about six months now. Um, we've got a meeting with them next Friday, uh, and we're hoping that in a year's time we'll have consolidation centres, not only in Perth, the original project, but also in the neighbouring city of Dundee. And the other benefits from the project are bringing on board Kevin's experiences. Um, once we've got something up and running, we know what works for local authority so we can more readily bring on the local authority procurement into the consolidation function. So that's very much where we are. So I can't quite plant the flag on there just you, yet. You but can plant your time flag. I hope to do. Yeah. You can plant your So I, I, I would say, could you plant your flag next Friday to be the first next flag? Well, I hope so. OK. I think with this promise, uh, we can go and have a drink or a beer or champagne or something, can we win? <laughs> yes, we can. I don't know about the champagne. But um, <laughs> we would like to close the, the, the conference here. Um, let me state a few uh, quick and conclusions maybe. Um, what have we heard today? Ensuring that stakeholders understand the impact and the benefits of using consolidation centers and sustainable modes of transport for last mile deliveries is key of course and behavior change is very important in that. The results of the pilots clearly show that and there has been a degree of behavior change in all of the pilots that are going on. Financial, environmental and social sustainability is also a key requirement for success if these models uh, are to be upscaled and replicated in the rest of Europe. We need new INCO terms for city logistics specifically and they are not in place yet. The private sector is still facing barriers for implementing sustainable last mile logistics and changes will have to be made on a public sector level in policies and laws. There's some disagreement as to where it has to happen on a European level or on the city scale level. Um, collaboration between private and uh, um, public sector is there uh, a very uh, important element. And we will have to take steps to scale up the pilots and to ensure their transferability volumes are are crucial, uh, crucial here. And uh, finally, hopefully, future funding can help us uh, to take uh, next steps for urban logistics in uh, Europe. And so I think this concludes the um, uh, Lamilo final conference. Please have a look at the website of Lamilo. It's lamiloproject.eu. And uh, go looking for the Knowledge Hub. All presentations will be on there, uh, some more discussions, facts and figures, and, and so forth. Um, I hope you found inspiration to uh, work further on the future of last mile logistics in Europe. I would like to thank you all for being here. I would like to thank the speakers for uh, presenting their uh, knowledge. I would like to uh, invite also the speakers to come forward for a picture right now. Thank you all. Um, and for later, have a safe trip home. Bye-bye. Thank you.